What's up, guys? Today we are talking about nutrition, principle-based learning, and the jab. So, this video is about the jab. It's about nutrition. It's about the jab. Nutrition? The jab. Nah. So let me first start with a little uh, anecdote here. So a couple months ago, a friend was passing through, I am in Vietnam, Hoi An, uh, Hoi An, Vietnam, passing through. And we had a talk at a coffee house about some basic martial arts training. He was preparing to, uh, to do one of these white collar fights. You know where they take guys through maybe six, eight weeks of training and then they kind of go at each other for uh, donations and what have you. And so one of the things that he had said was uh, he didn't feel like the coach had given him enough freedom in training. You know, he was very specific in the way that he wanted him to do things and uh, didn't really allow him to kind of experiment and try things his own way. And um, yeah, and, I, and so I want to talk about both perspectives because I think that this is a big issue with learning things in general. And it's also a big difference between what you might consider the difference between a student and a master in a craft. Now, in general, the student values variety, right, with anything. I mean, you go into any, any craft or anything and you want, you want to see more, you want more exposure, you want to do more, and, and this kind of mentality leads to you know, a plethora of jack of all trades in the world where a lot of people never get past that first stage of excitement, right? They do something and they learn a lot of stuff about that thing, none of it very well, but they learn a lot of those things. Then as soon as it starts to get a little bit mundane and they have to, they feel they have to start doing real work in specific directions, they jump ship and they try something else. And then on the other side, you've got the craftsman's approach, which is not doing a lot of things by any means. And, and it's not even doing a lot of different um, types of crafts, it's very much sticking to a few key tools within a specific craft. It may be in some crafts that's a, quite a wide number of tools if they do this for decades and decades, but for the most part, most masters of certain crafts are exceptional at a very small number or subset of specific skills that transfer to a wide range of scenarios and circumstances. So I asked him, well, you know, how'd you do in the fight? Did you win the fight? No, didn't win the fight. Okay. So let's back things up now to the teacher's perspective. The teacher was thinking, look, you can experiment, but I've got decades in this game, and I'm gonna give you the, the most necessary tools to help you hopefully survive this. It's not about having a lot of variety and about experimenting. This is about giving you tried and tested techniques that will allow you to make it through and hopefully win. What you saw in this video was uh, me going through a little bit of a boxing, if not kickboxing uh, sequence, but looking at the foundations, right? So every boxing coach worth his salt is going to force the student to really, really study in depth the jab and every other technique ongoing, but you start with the basics. The jab is an essential distancing tool. Without a jab, you almost never find people survive in the game of boxing. You find a few guys known for big knockout punches like Mike Tyson, but if you watch his training videos, you will see some of the fastest and sharpest jabs you've ever seen. Now any, again, any boxing coach worth his salt is gonna isolate that one tool. They're gonna tie the other arm around the body and they're gonna force that student to throw thousands upon thousands of jabs, entering toward a target, moving away from a target, angling to different degrees from his target. You're gonna see that student so sick of doing jabs that he's ready to puke from them. But in the process, he will learn how to distance time and space his opponent. And those skills, uh, my dear listeners, transfer to every other technique in boxing, right? So if you exclude that, 
you can't quite make it up. The jab is the fastest tool. It is the tool that is closest to your opponent. If you neglect that, good luck getting by with all the others. So how does this relate to nutrition? Now in a weightlessness nutrition, right, for my programs, uh, there are three stages of nutrition. And that's not to make things overly complex. And the premise behind it is that I don't want people to live according to certain dictums and rules all the time because I think that it makes us fundamentally neurotic. And weightlessness as a system and as a philosophy is not about doing a bunch of shit forever and becoming a robot. It is about learning the foundations and being able to live intuitively so that hopefully we can experience more and more moments of weightlessness, right? Weightless moments where we're not psychologically burdened by all of our self-doubt, our anger, our frustration, our fixations on ideas and diets, uh, or even physically weighed down, stiff and heavy and what have you, right? It's really about generating a sense of weightlessness in life. And I think one of the easiest ways to kill that is to fixate on what you are eating all the time and to fixate on your body composition. So weightlessness nutrition, without going into all the specifics and details, is designed to graduate people up from a foundation of health and detoxification to body transformation into more intuitive living and eating where you can eat pretty much whatever the hell you want um, without having to worry about weight gain or being able to sustain high levels of performance. Not a bad proposition. So let's just talk about stage one and stage two. Stage one, very simply, is eating vegetables and meat, fish, or eggs only, nothing else. This is not designed to carry people on for a long haul, and a lot of people misinterpret this as the W diet. They also misinterpret this as possibly being a paleolithic approach or a ketogenic diet. Now, it does have overlaps, and if you do this for a few weeks, you will be in a state of ketosis. Fine, all well and good. But the point of this, of this phase of the diet is to teach you how to manage your insulin. Because when we go to the second stage, we start to reintroduce grains and sugars and other uh, you know, types of uh, foodstuffs. We might incorporate tubers, nuts, and seeds as well. But not all the time. We are trying to focus those other things, especially the more complex carbohydrate sources or the fruits for simple sugars after workouts which means we are creating a need for that energy first. We are depleting our muscles of glycogen, we are refueling with those very fast and ready fuel sources so that we do not store them as fat. And this is a way of understanding that first of all, we need to earn our calories, and second of all, there are optimal times to actually feed and fuel them. And when we start to feel that powerful impact, that when we, ha that when we don't train, we have uh, uh, days that we are not training, we're not adding in those carbohydrate sources, we start to realize that our body is rapidly getting leaner, right? We are getting stronger, we are getting leaner at a rapid pace, but then on the other days, we are also realizing that we're able to build and sustain muscle, but with that, we need those other faster fuels to be able to fuel that harder, more intense work. So to bring this back to home, stage one in weightlessness nutrition is mastering the foundations, the stuff that you could throw all other foodstuffs away and you could still survive and be perfectly healthy by stage one nutrition. Get ample supply of those veggies and a healthy source of lean proteins and you are good to go. It might not even need to be that lean depending on how your body responds to them. But that is the jab. And if you master that one thing, it gives you the foundation to be able to explore a whole other arena of body transformation, fat loss, uh, muscle gain. All of these things stem from the next phase. Now the next stage incorporates adding back in sugars and carbohydrates. Sugars from fruit, ideally, and other types of complex carbs from grains. Now these are more akin to your knockout punch, your right cross. Without doing the basics in stage one and minimizing variables to an absolute minimum, we don't actually get to learn how our body is responding to certain types of food. And most importantly, the types of food that we absolutely need to sustain health and performance. But once we do that, we can learn the knockout punch. And that knockout punch is essentially learning how to integrate more carbohydrate sources, grains and sugars, as the right cross or the knockout punch. And so that knockout punch really is the story of insulin control, right? That hormone that is the storage hormone in the body that determines whether or not what you're eating is gonna get used as fuel, stored as fat, but applying this only at key times, which is when you've created a need for that energy, and then you are adding essentially that surplus of calories after workouts or in the windows after workouts, 
you're giving your body now an opportunity to use all those nutrients constructively. And it is in this dynamic, right? Mastering the foundations that allow you to understand how to apply that knockout punch that can also, by the way, knock you out. And so the biggest risk in moving too quickly beyond the jab and boxing is that if you don't understand spacing, distancing, timing that you can acquire through that one skill, and then you go for the knockout punch, well, the knockout punch takes more time and it's farther away from the target. It will always expose you to more risk. You are more likely of getting knocked out in attempting that. In the same way, if you don't understand how to implement carbohydrate intake, when to eat those grains and sugars, well, they're gonna get stored as body fat and start to weigh you down, right? You're gonna to start to feel lethargic, toxified, not so clear-headed, right? So this really is a double-edged sword. And so with nutrition, understanding when to use that double-edged sword, that knockout punch, those carbohydrates, is the difference between storing it as body fat and feeling heavy and lethargic, or using them productively to fuel work and to build muscle. So let's take a step back from both nutrition and boxing for a second and look at principle-based learning. This is just essentially a longer advocacy for how we approach things, right? Not to look for as much variety and excitement through everything that we're dealing with, but trying to find those essential things that we cannot do without and that we are willing to put our time in. The simple question is, are you doing something every single day that is meaningful? And by meaningful, I mean, can you take it out of your life without any harm? And if the answer is no, if, you're, if your life is worse off by removing it, or it's certainly gonna be better by doing it every day, that is a meaningful thing that is worth mastering and worth putting your time into. So guys, identify those jabs in whatever you're doing, master them, put your time in, and hopefully they will allow all the other tools and skills you're learning to be applied with a bit more ease. So if you've enjoyed this little rant on the jab, nutrition, and principle-based learning, yeah, let me know guys. Hopefully like, subscribe, leave a comment. Let me know if you've got any interest in uh, specific directions a la mind-body training, and I will try to hit those. And otherwise, be weightless.